church engaged in a generous mutual sharing of material things with one another. Paul was dismayed at the way in which the social distinctions and arrogance of the outside world had crept into the church in Corinth as they celebrated the Lord's Supper. Those who had plenty ate a lot, and those who had little ate very little at the Lord's Supper. And he said, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat when you do that. It, it has nothing of the character of Christianity when that happens. Anisimus, the slave, was to return to his master Philemon in the book of Philemon, but to be welcomed back as a brother. It's a most remarkable document, short letter that Paul writes to a slave owner. The slave has escaped, the slave Onesimus, which means useful, great name for a slave. It's like calling your, your car, you know, roadworthy. Um, you want a slave to be useful, isn't it? Um, so Onesimus escapes and goes to Paul. And what does Paul do? Does Paul say, slavery is a corrupt institution and we should have nothing to do with it? He sends Onesimus back to his slave master, but he sends him back and says, receive him back as a brother. That's a remarkable and completely radical way for, for him to think. And it's, uh, I mean, it turns out there is a bishop Onesimus in the early church, recorded in the first century. And I've often wondered what it would have been like if this was the same Onesimus uh, for Philemon, the slave owner, to go and sit under the teaching of Onesimus, his former slave. <coughs> Only the Christian church could have made that possible in the ancient world. And the gospel makes that possible because of their deep equality, their fraternity in the faith. Uh, James, uh, the letter of James, in James, he positively hoes into his reader, readers for, for showing favouritism with regard to the wealthy in the handing out of significant seats. Remember those passages where uh, he says, you know, when, when the wealthy person comes in, don't usher them to the best seat in the house. Actually, rather, when the poorest comes in, usher him to the best seat, um, because that, there you will show your true recognition of, the, of the, what the gospel is about. So the equality of the believers was not some abstract, merely spiritual thing. It was to be expressed in the actions of the church. Or, I should say, as in everything in the Christian life, it was an embodied spirituality. That is, it wasn't sort of up there and not down here. It was up there and down here at the same time. It was, it was, it was an embodied spirituality. It was a lived reality. It was to be for them. So, what are we to do with this equality when we have received and understood? <clears throat> well, what would Jesus do is for once the right question. Because we read in Philippians 2 this remarkable tale of, uh, this remarkable depiction of Jesus as the humble Lord. Uh, and Paul says, Our attitude is to be the same as Christ Jesus, who, though being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Extraordinary passage of scripture, probably a song, an early hymn that Paul sticks into the letter to the Philippians. Christ, equal with God, does not grasp or seize or demand his rights, but rather takes on the form uh, of a slave. We should use the word slave. We often soften it and use the word servant, but slave really makes it much darker for us and humbles himself for the sake of those who need it for the sake of others. So notice what equality does not mean in the Bible's account of it. It does not mean the erasure of all difference. In fact, quite the opposite. Though it promises the restitution of injustices, the Bible <coughs> celebrates and delights in difference. The complementary difference of male and female is not dissolved by their basic created sameness or by their union together in Christ. So they are deeply, they're, they're profoundly equal, they are different, and their, their, and, and their sameness isn't, doesn't dissolve that, and their equality doesn't dissolve that, um, and neither does their union together. So just as the Old Testament described the king as merely a leader of his peers, rather than a superior order of being, very stark in the ancient world, by the way, that, that a king in Israel was only just one of, one of you, he wasn't kind of a god, which was very ancient, typical ancient way to think of kings. Um, 
The New Testament recognises that people are differently gifted to serve without there being a qualitative difference between them, and that authority can and should be exercised in churches. So what we have from the Bible is not a bland levelling equality, without distinction, without recognition of different gifting or the need for authority. But rather we have an equality that is the byproduct of love, the seeking of an imbalance in favour of the other according to needs. What does equality mean as far as we see we hear it from Jesus then? It is rather a humbling of oneself and lifting up the other. Not a, by the way, not demanding that others humble themselves for you. And so the, the word equality, at one level, it's not about uh, making everyone equal with everyone else. It's about making me, it's about, it's about a call to the individual. And what can I do to make myself, to humble myself, so that others are lifted up? And if everybody loved their neighbour as themselves, as Kierkegaard said, uh, as an expression of love, then, then complete equality would be achieved. So once again, on to equality in practice. I might pause then and ask if there's some clarification questions before we get into more substantial discussion a little bit later. Is there any, any clarification questions at that point? You lost me with the embodiment business. I lost you with the embodiment business. Um, all I'm trying to say is that um, it's not as if you and I are equal in some lofty spiritual sense. Up there, our equality is somehow hidden. It's actually something that has to be recognised in our actual action, in our, in our actual community life together. Um, it, it has to actually, actually take form in the way we eat together, in the way we actually deal with one another day by day. In quite practical, the New Testament is quite practical about it. So it says, seating arrangements matter. Um, how we eat together matters. How we deal with our possessions matters. Uh, am, I, uh, am I humbling myself to lift others up? And quite concrete, quite practical. So that's what I'm, what I'm trying to say, that in the New Testament, the, the spiritual is not separate from what we do with our hands. You know, we, that, that is a spiritual thing for us. It would, it would reflect a spiritual reality when we do that. And one of the problems that you have trying to get people across the line, if there's such a word, is the fact that in the Bible there is so many rules, and, and even today the modern Kabbalists live according to those rules.